Hello everyone. My name is Dr. Russell Barkley and I'm a clinical professor of psychiatry at the Medical University of South Carolina. I want to thank Jojo for the invitation to speak to you this morning about ADHD and especially about the social costs linked to ADHD across the lifespan. Where time permits, I'll also speak about some of the treatment implications from these findings. Now, I have presented far too many slides to you in your handout than I can cover in the 40 to 45 minutes that I have been allotted. So I'm going to be commenting on just a few lines on each of the slides as I go through them because time simply doesn't permit me to go over each and every single finding or detail that is on these slides. Now one of the first social costs to be documented in ADHD research was the substantial difficulties that these children and teenagers have as they grow up within the educational system. More than 90% of children and teens with ADHD have difficulties in school if they are not being treated. These difficulties can result in a number of other downstream consequences for the individual, including being retained in grade or held back in school, being suspended or expelled from school, being placed in special education, but most importantly because of its economic costs is the fact that at least a third of ADHD children who are untreated may wind up dropping out of school and not completing their compulsory education. And even among those who do complete their education, they often have lower academic achievement skills, a lower class ranking, uh, and if they go on to try to attempt a college program, they are likely to have difficulty completing that program, as you can see here. Only about 5 to 10 percent of children with ADHD who enter college are likely to complete their college program. Now, there are a number of implications of these kinds of costs in the educational system for our society and for how to manage these individuals. We know that upwards of 350,000 to 500,000 US dollars is the cost to our society of a child not completing school. That is because of the lower income they're likely to receive, their greater dependence on any sort of social welfare or rehabilitation system, uh, and of course just reduced value to society from being less educated. So I think there are a number of implications from these findings as to what we need to do to reduce these costs, not the least of which is to make sure that school officials are well informed about ADHD, particularly teachers, that they understand that it's a neurobiological disorder and not the fault of families, and that they also understand that it is linked to a number of adverse consequences within the educational system if it is not treated properly. So I have been recommending that I think it's important now that we screen all children entering kindergarten for ADHD. This can be done very quickly using a parent completed rating scale of ADHD symptoms, which has a very high success rate at identifying children who are likely then on further evaluation to go on to be diagnosed formally with ADHD. Doing so would allow us to get started earlier in the lives of these children uh, and hopefully would help us to reduce the burden to the school system, to the family, to society by improving their likelihood of succeeding within school. So early intervention is going to be very important, I think, to help reduce these risks. I also think it's important that schools begin to focus in high school on providing some occupational or vocational training for individuals with ADHD after they have assessed them for whatever aptitudes they may have for various vocations. And then of course there is the need for extended release medications being given to the child in order to help them across the school day, across the waking hours of the day, and when homework must be done uh, in order to reduce their ADHD symptoms and improve their likelihood of succeeding in school and with their homework assignments. 
Not all ADHD children require medication, but in my experience, at least 70 to 80 percent of them will require medication at some point during childhood or adolescence to help them to cope with these educational demands and the risks associated with them.